of Acts reminds us that the early church was dynamic. When they were dispersed to other regions by religious persecution, the followers of Christ brought with them the gospel. Consequently, the name of Christ spread like wildfire. Stephen's martyrdom, the conversions of Saul and Cornelius, and the founding of the Church of Antioch, where the believers were first called Christians, ushered in the growth of Gentile missions. The second half of the book of Acts is focused primarily on Paul's missionary journeys. A Bible scholar observes that Paul was like a hunted deer, leaving tracts of blood as he moved from one region to another, proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Yet, Paul says, In our affliction, I am overflowing with joy. Saul the persecutor, who became Paul the apostle, finds joy in bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul, his partners, and co-laborers in the Lord's work were moved by the Holy Spirit to preach, teach, heal, demonstrate God's love in synagogues, schools, homes, marketplaces, courtrooms, streets, and wherever God leads them to call people to Christ. As we live in the last days of spiritual deception, secularism, persecution, and apostasy, what have we become as people of God? Have we become complacent, or have we remained dynamic and explosive as the early church? As the bride of Christ, are we still faithful to and in Him? Brothers and sisters in the Lord, good morning. Now, how many of you have seen the uh, YouTube videos about Tito, Vic, and Joey at least in the past few weeks? Okay, may ilang takers. Well, I'm not going to talk about eight bulaga. <laughs> yeah, it so happened that after watching some of those issues, I was also able to see some recommended videos wherein uh, Tito sent was actually interviewed back then, so this is not politicking because it happened uh, several years ago, when he was actually interviewed and he was asked, if ever you were elected into the office of uh, being president of the Philippines, what will be your uh, leadership model? Then he answered, servant leadership. Upon hearing that, I was quite elated because definitely he was able to read scripture because when we talk about servant leadership, it talks about the model of Jesus Christ. Now, whether you're going to apply leadership or live the common Christian life, I want you to remember that one important element of it is humility. But we have to understand humility on the basis of Scripture. In this case, as we study Acts chapter 17, maybe some of you are asking, why are we reading Philippians chapter 2? Well, the reason why I wanted to start with the book of Philippians is, number one, before going to Thessalonica, in Acts chapter 7, he came from Philippi. And secondly, when he served in Thessalonica, he actually was supported by the brethren in Philippi. And there he gave a very important encouragement, coming from the model of Christ himself, that in order for us to be able to serve God, we have to have humility. In order for us to be used mightily, effectively in sharing the good news and serving others, you need humility. Without humility, you cannot do either of both. So that would be something difficult to do. So humility, as introduced in Scripture, is not just being quiet. No, being quiet is just being quiet. Humility is a, uh, there are, it's a principle of humility if we look at Scripture. What is the principle of humility when it comes to the Bible? Humility is uh, defined this way. Uh, I don't know if you've read the book of Tom Holiday. The title is The Relationship Principles of Jesus. When you read that book, Tom Holliday said, looking at the model of the life of Jesus Christ, this is the principle. First, be at your best. 
Now maybe you're thinking, some eyebrows probably are raised and you're thinking, how can it be that you will be at your best with talking about humility? You know, most of the time when we talk about humility, we're thinking we have to be in the least possible condition. Well, no problem uh, in giving way to others if it's uh, probably in connection to a line. No? Uh, for example, we have a long line, a queue, and you're in front, you see somebody behind, and you're thinking, I would allow that person to take my place so that that person will be in front, and I'll, uh, oh, I'm willing to sacrifice and be at the back. No problem with that. That's okay. But when it comes to ministry, when it comes to the development of your gifts, you have to understand the principle of giving your best is there at the forefront. It's not going to contradict humility. But it's going to tell you that the principles that Jesus is teaching cannot be in conflict with one another. Why? Because, for example, this is a classroom setting. Uh, Reverend Hem is the most intelligent student in this class. And then he's thinking, well, Pastor Jay is always number three. And the others are, of course, down the line. So probably I'm not going to do my best. I'm not going to study hard. So number two will become number one. Number three will become number two and so on and so forth. I'm just going to settle for probably number five up until number ten. Is that a good thing? When it comes to stewardship, that's a bad thing. Because if the Lord has actually invested potentials in your life, you have to use it to the utmost. That's the principle of stewardship in the Bible. And secondly, this will affect the kind of service that you will be giving later on. So the first part of the principle, be at your best. The second part, but have the heart to serve. This is the complete statement. Be at your best, but have the heart to serve. If you were able to give to the Lord uh, the best uh, uh, kind of service, and then you would like to give your heart so that the Lord will use you, the kind of ministry, the kind of use that God would actually have for you is, of course, of a higher quality. You understand this? Because if my life has not been developed properly, I have not been a good steward, I have not actually honed my talent, skills, and ability to a higher level, this will be the problem. If I will allow my life to be used by the Lord, the kind of service that I can give is of a low quality. For it to be a high quality service, I have to give my best. So that is the principle. Now there's a picture of stewardship. When we talk about the picture of stewardship, we talk about Jesus himself. You know, in Philippians, Apostle Paul actually talked about uh, Jesus being a very good pattern. And what is the pattern of uh, humility? Well, in the New Testament, it's always being repeated that he that came from above came down here on earth to take on human form. Now, why is that always reiterated? First and foremost, for us to understand the kind of life that was sent to us is the best kind. Secondly, that you are that important to God. You are treated so of high value because the kind of life that was given in your behalf is of good quality. You can never accuse the God of the Bible of actually undermining you or shorthanding you because you have been given the best. Now, this is the principle here that we are being given. The picture is Jesus. Even though his life is divine, perfect, and holy, and yet he made a decision. He made a choice to give his life so that we will be benefited by it. Now, remember, humility and abuse are two different things. Let me reiterate that. Humility and abuse are two different things. In humility, you have an option to do or not to do. In abuse, sometimes you're coerced. You cannot uh, make a decision. That's why you're in a spot wherein you're irritated that you're being forced to do something. In this case, humility, you're thinking others will benefit if I set aside my own uh, welfare or if I set, set aside my own pleasures. And by that sacrifice, others will actually have a better condition or situation. Why am I using this model now? When you look at Acts chapter 17, what you will find in this chapter is that Apostle Paul, as he was pushed deeper into Gentile territory, he experienced different kinds of opposition in ministry. And yet, we have to realize that he has to have the mindset of Christ. But first, allow me to read to you Acts chapter 17. It will be verses 2 to 4. And this is what we can find. As was his custom... 
Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. Now, when we look at that particular kind of uh, ministry that he did to the uh, to the Gentiles. No, actually, it's not the, purely the Gentiles. There were Jewish believers since he went to the synagogue. This is actually a kind of uh, reality check. As you look at the narrative written by Luke, he was showing that as much as there was a welcome that has been experienced by those who serve uh, in the name of Jesus, a lot of them experienced a tremendous opposition. In Thessalonica, when he went there, his intention was to make them realize who Jesus really is. That he is not simply a historical figure, not just a common human being, which they were saying, but he is indeed the fulfillment of the prophecies. Now, you know, uh, many years ago, I spoke in a, a big gathering. And before I spoke, a person will uh, uh, give a testimony. Now, he was wearing some traditional garb, and I'm thinking to myself, what is this guy? Is this a prophet? Or uh, I was so intrigued. We were in the same holding area, so I asked him, uh, and uh, he was a foreigner. I asked, so, sir, what's your background? He said, well, uh, you, you were looking at me since I came in here. I am a Jewish rabbi. He said, I am a scholar when it comes to the Old Testament scripture. And uh, the truth is, when I was about to write a book, that book was to disprove that Jesus is the promised Messiah or Savior in the Old Testament. This book, I wanted it to be for the Christians, that when they read it, their minds will be cleared up, that what they have made a connection to is wrong. Jesus is just a person, a common Jewish man, a questionable background, but uh, he's not the Savior. But then I realized through what he was saying that they were not reading the New Testament. So he said, in order for me to be effective in my pursuit in writing this book, I have to read the New Testament. And when I read it and discovered all the things about Jesus Christ, I was shocked. He said, give or take, there are about a hundred prophecies, direct or indirect, about Jesus Christ. And all of them had been fulfilled in him. So that's not coincidence. It only leads to one conclusion, that the Savior, the Messiah that has been prophesied in the Old Testament is indeed Jesus Christ. So he said, the reason why I am here, going to testify before you, because I actually accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. You can say I am now a Christian convert, and I have seen, and I have studied the, the scriptures, the truth, that Jesus indeed is God. And he is the Savior. Imagine that, no? This is one among the, the many occasions wherein there's a personality after seeing the totality of what Scripture contains. Uh, would have his mind and heart touched and would be compelled to make a decision to transform. Not only that, to uh, change affiliation from denying Christ to receiving and recognizing Jesus. But uh, there are a lot of them also who will resist. In Thessalonica, this is indeed the case. When Paul was actually talking to them about Jesus Christ, what happened? The people there were uh, somehow appalled about what he was saying. Yes, there were those who listened. There were those who accepted the truth. But a, a number of them were looking for a way to actually contradict Apostle Paul. Because for them, what he was saying was actually turning things around. It was confusing a lot of people. And for them, what he was saying was contradictory to the traditional way of doing things. And I'm thinking, what they did would cause any lighthearted person to quit. You know, ministry. Just like any other calling when we talk about the Christian life. It is necessary for us to truly have passion and conviction. If you do not have that, it is easy for you to raise up your hands and say, I don't want to do this anymore. You can either neglect it or outright turn your back and walk away. 
because at some point you will feel different kinds of difficulties. There will be hurts. In the case of Paul, imagine there's outright contradiction. There were people who were telling others that what he was saying was not true. Now, that's where the mindset of Christ is important, related to the lesson of humility. Now, there are three things that Apostle Paul makes mention of that. The first one, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Now, I want you to remember, in the Christian life, it is not wrong to have an ambition. Sometimes, as I'm talking to some of my students in uh, Bible college, I have to tell them, there are certain things about the uh, Filipino culture we have to modify, especially about having ambition. So they're asking me, why, sir? Sabi ko, in the Philippines, if a person has ambition, anong tawag natin? Ambitioso. Positive, negative. Negative. Kaya mga Pilipino, walang ambition. <laughs> because you're actually somehow seen as, uh, di ba? Uh, it's negative. But uh, I'm telling them, well, having an ambition is not wrong. In the book of Proverbs, it's stated that without vision, people will perish. So very important that we have a, uh, a goal. We are sometimes prompted by God in order for us to fulfill a project in life. That's no a problem. You will submit to God your dreams, you will submit to God your goals, your, submit, uh, your, your ambitions, so that it will be clarified. Is it something I need to pursue or is, that, is it something simply selfish? Or is this God-ordained or not? But once approved by the Lord and there's clarity that it, indeed, it is indeed uh, according to the will of the Lord, then by all means move forward with the assurance that it has the backing of God's approval. That's very important. But the reason why we are being told, do nothing out of selfish ambition, if you're just going to think about yourself, it's easy for us to let go of the essential things in service. Why? Of course, whenever you're thinking about yourself, you're thinking about your own integrity, right? You're thinking about your own comfort. You're thinking about your own pleasure. By nature, we are protecting ourselves. It's self-preservation. But then somehow, when you serve the Lord, the whole system is different. When you're going to serve, you have to think about God's will first. You will love God above all. Second, you have to have consideration for the welfare of other people. In this case, as you have known Christ as personal Lord and Savior, it is what expected of you that as you enjoy this, as this is something that is something uh, you can say that is prominent in your life because you are saved by God. It is not something you just keep. It is something that you have to share. But if you're not thinking about other people, if you're not thinking about them being taken out of the clutches of the enemy, if you're not thinking about them being cl given clarity so that uh, in order for that to happen, you have to go to them and plant the seed of truth and salvation so that the prompting and the conviction of the Lord be upon their lives, then these people will continue on being confused. It's not only about myself. It is not only about my welfare. Sometimes there are certain things I need to give up so that I'll be able to go forward and do service in the name of the Lord. This is very important. Because in Thessalonica, they badmouthed Paul. They threatened his life. They contradicted his teachings in public. They chased him out of that place. And that was something difficult. Second, value, your, uh, value others above yourself. You know, this is something also difficult to do. But valuing them is also seeing the potential that can basically come out of their lives. And what is that? They too can have a saving knowledge of Christ as Lord and Savior, and then they can also be used by God. They can be members of God's family. Paul knew this very well. If you look at his background when he was still Saul, the Pharisee, he was so passionate in uh, persecuting the believers. We have read in the earlier part of the book of Acts, what did he do? He caused some to be imprisoned. He actually agitated crowds in order to help, uh, to, uh, to hurt the Christians. And he was also instrumental in the death of some of them, including Stephen. That was what he was before. Who would have imagined that this guy who was persecuting the early church, 
Now, with the touch of the love of God and with the uh, blessing of the Spirit of the Lord, we know him as Apostle Paul, a person who did not only preach to the Jews, taught the Gentiles as well. Here was a person used to write about 13 of the New Testament books. And we see here a person who was even willing to confront death because he knew that even though he will die for him to live is Christ and to die is gain, and we uh, are encouraged by looking at his life. He's not perfect, but we saw the potential. We also saw what uh, the Lord was able to do in his life. This is very important. Value others more than yourself. That's why the third, in connection to humility, he has to think about the interest of others. I know Jesus. I'm saved, so there's security in my life. But then there's also an obligation. If you look at the Great Commission, we are actually being commanded by the Lord to go and make disciples. That's very important. So we need to go there. I cannot convert another person. I did a Bible study in one company, and one person stood up in the Q&A portion and uh, actually accused me. You're here because you want to convert us. I told that person, I cannot convert you. (laughs) You know why? To be able to be converted, it's a decision you have to make. It's not mine to make for you. I can teach you all I can. But if you don't make that decision, conversion cannot happen. It is a surrender of your life from you controlling yourself to allowing God to take full control of your life. That's how conversion happens. It's willful. It's your decision, not somebody else making that decision and forcing you to do that decision. It has to be voluntary. It has to be from the heart. And that's exactly what's, uh, what's here. When we look at Apostle Paul, he was thinking about other people. Now, When we uh, move forward to uh, 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 Acts chapter 17, I want you to look at four things in connection to humility and service. If you can indeed find this in your life. You know, humility is something very hard to claim, right? Pag sinabi mo, humble ako, ako, iba na ang dating. Correct? Uh, When other people would actually give you that introduction, one of the introductions that will give you pressure, di ba, misa sasabihin, uh, he's very intense. And uh, he's the top of his class. When you stand up in front, you know that the people has high expectations. But if they add to that, as your introduction, he's a very humble person. How do you react? How do you carry that particular you know, category or label? Very difficult. But then, when we talk about us really surrendering our lives to Jesus, wanting to give our best to him and be used for service, and us also seeing the value of what we can do, as we also have the heart to reach out to others so that the Lord can use us as instruments, these are the four things that should be included in your checklist uh, to be able to know, am I doing God's will? Am I truly pursuing what matters most? Fulfilling the commission of the Lord. I have salvation, now how do I share it? Step number one, there is a need for us to have sacrifice. You know, I was reading the book of William Dyerness. The uh, title of his book is Persuasive Christianity in Today's Culture. It's a very good introduction for Christian apologetics or the defense of the Christian faith. There he, uh, he actually wrote and dis- uh, discussed about the three uh, particular groups that uh, the early Christians needed to clarify or probably... Uh, uh, argue with, when I say argue, not fight with, but to explain out their faith uh, towards these three groups. The first one, they have to talk to the Jews. And what's the issue of the Jews with Christians? Well, we share the Old Testament, but there's a break, uh, a uh, basically a time where we split apart when we talk about Jesus, as I've already mentioned uh, in my introduction. We can see that many of them do not regard Jesus as Lord and Savior. So our goal is to point them to Scripture and tell them, like Apostle Paul, that indeed Jesus is the Messiah. And He is the Savior. Very important. And William Darnes is saying, when you look at the New Testament, that's one of those things that you can find that the early believers were doing. That's why many of the early Christian converts were from Jewish descent. 
That's why even if you read the writings, uh, the, the letter of James to the church, what do you find there? He addressed them to the 12 tribes of Israel. Why do you think he wrote that? Is, was he only writing to Jews? No, most likely according to Bible scholars, he wrote that as an introduction because majority of the early Christians were Jewish. So uh, there were converts, people who understood the connection. Now the second, they had to talk to the Gentiles, people who were holding on to Greek thought. And we re remember the different philosophers of Greece introduced a lot of thinking that affected the lives of people. Later on, we'll be talking about the Epicureans and also the Stoics. You will know that there are a lot of philosophers that talk about pleasure. And many of them, when they talk about pleasure, they talked about pleasure of the flesh. That the whole point of living is maximizing the pleasure of the flesh. That's why many of them relate to the saying, eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow you die. I don't know if you were here in the earlier part of the year, actually exposed that particular line. Eating there is gluttony. Drinking there is really drunkenness because that's what they're after. The pleasure of being drunk. And merrymaking there is related to all kinds of sexual practices. And tomorrow you shall die because they don't believe in an afterlife. They don't believe in accountability to the gods. So that's why there's a sense of urgency. They want to live the here and now maximizing all kinds of early pleasure. Sa Pilipino, merong version yan. Pero religious naman yung sa atin. Ano yun? Sa langit, wala nang beer. Di ba? So dito na daw mag uh, I mean, you understand. That's why there's a sense of urgency because they're being taught there's no longer that kind of pleasure there. Now, imagine uh, the early Greek teachings. It was uh, affecting Greek society and you will go there. And what will you teach? You will be teaching a different way of life. And what is that way of life? The fruit of the Spirit. He talks about them in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, hanggang self-control. And then he says, this is what needs to come out of your life. These are the good stuff. Then, you look at that particular chapter. He demonized the ways of the world. Lust. Immorality. He talks about all kinds of things, enumerating it. And these were the common practices of the people. Drunkenness, sorcery, what have you. They were doing this on a regular basis. We can even say it's already part of their way of life. It's a cultural thing for them. Then suddenly you're saying it's wrong. And you will be telling them that if I am with Jesus Christ, I abandon all those things. And I'm going to live a life that's going to move away from that towards a life of holiness. Not many are actually pleased. Right? You're enjoying that. Now you're thinking, I'm going to take away all of those enjoyments from my life. Sacrifice. Paul needed to talk to them. And there's a third. He had to defend the Christian faith against the outlook of the Roman Empire. They're thinking that the early believers were just dissenters causing uh, riots and stirring up the crowds. Then that's exactly how Apostle Paul was portrayed by the people in Thessalonica. He was, uh, uh, they were shouting that he was a person who was turning things around, confusing the people. And so when they agitated the crowd, the crowd actually went after Paul. When they could not find him, they went to the house of Jason, the one who was hosting these people. And even that person, they, uh, they gave him a problem. This is what happens back then. Uh, these are the discomfort, these are the, the, the difficulties of service. But why would these believers continue in what they were doing? Because they believed in Jesus. They accepted the call. And so despite the fact that it will inconvenience them, they did what will be glorifying to the Lord. That sacrifice. Now, there's a second thing that you can find here. When we talk about humility and service, it talks about servanthood. You know, I was reading a book. According to the behaviorist who wrote it, there are groups of people that we will be willingly serving. Now, I'm not going to say that these particular status in life is bad. But there are times you will find yourself 
pleasing people that are able to reach up to this particular category and willingly serve them. The reason is because there will be returns for you. A powerful person, a person in position. Why will you serve a person like that willingly? Because you can use that person's status, right? You know, you see in the Philippines, it's something common. When you violate traffic rules, especially on a Sunday, then a traffic enforcer suddenly appears. You know what? Instead of simply dealing with your violation and paying the fine, what do we do? You take out your phone or that ever popular and powerful calling card. I know, general. Uh, I mean, it will take so much time in discussing this with the enforcer. And then, of course, that poor guy whom you uh, uh, name drop, they will call that person and inconvenience that person. In the end, nobody is a violator in the Philippines because everybody has a friend. <laughs> call a friend. <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? It's easy to serve a person with power and position because you can gain something. A popular person. You would be willingly serving a popular person. I don't know much about other social media sites. I'm a low techy guy. My, uh, one of the members in church when I was there uh, uh, suddenly shrieked in uh, jubilation. <laughs> Sabi niya, I was followed by this guy. I did not understand. For me, the wordings is like stalking. <laughs> and stalking is a bad thing. Because she's saying, I was followed by this guy. So I, I need clarification. Why are you happy? Do you like the guy? No, no, pastor. Uh, I think it's in Instagram, ba? When he was followed by this person, this person that was popular in social media. And because of that, it will give her boosted recognition. And that would also add to her popularity. Now, that's the reason why we could probably say that we can easily follow or serve a person who has that advantage, popular, people with wealth. It's easy for us to follow and to serve them because probably there's something that can be given back in return. I'm not saying again that if you fall under these categories, you're a bad person. No. What I'm saying is according to that behavior is we are willing to serve these kinds of people. But why am I emphasizing this point? When we talk about us being used by the Lord for service, as we follow his pattern, he basically went around and he gave his life attention and time to people not only of the higher status, but even in the lower levels of society. But all of them together, whether powerful, rich, or popular, all have one thing in common, even with the lower people of society. We cannot pay him back, right? You can never pay him back. You have salvation. It is because of his sacrifice. You enjoy eternal life. Is it because he gave up his life for you? That's the truth. And we cannot repay him. When he went to the sick, when he went to, uh, to the demon possessed, he went to people who could never pay him back. So service is not about what you get in return. Service is your desire to be used by God so that other people will benefit. Now, in the second, uh, uh, in this particular uh, step number two in servanthood, we find Apostle Paul, after being pushed away from Thessalonica, he actually went to Berea. Now, when we look at Berea, that particular location, even though he also uh, went to the synagogue, the Jewish people there were considered to be more, let's use the word, fair. They're more tempered because as they were listening to him, maybe some of them did not agree, but they did not attack him immediately. You know what they did? They consulted the scripture. So they were fair. As uh, they were listening to Paul, they were looking at the scripture. Was he consistent in what he was saying connected to this? When they realized that what he was saying was connected to what's actually written as God's revelation to mankind, some of them believed. Some of them followed him. Some, some of them wanted to learn from him all the more. But you know what? If the servant of God has passion, the persecutors are also passionate. Coming from the place of Thessalonica, they heard that he was in Berea. You know what they did? They followed after him. And they pestered him there. 
And they stirred up the crowd again. That's why he had to be sent away again. Sometimes people are asking the question, why so much persecution? Why would God allow that? Is this the proof that indeed the mission is ineffective? That really it has to be difficult for the believers when they are serving? Not necessarily so. You have to see it from the background of God. I was reading one missiologist and he's saying, you know, it is possible for a person that if he's welcomed and he feels comfortable in one spot to simply stay there. That may not necessarily be a bad thing. But during this time, if you read the book of Acts, there's a need for them to go into the different parts of the world because they needed to spread the good news. So sometimes, if you look at why God allowed persecution, it is actually to push them away from the lo that locality. So you planted the seed, somebody is going to follow and follow up uh, these people. The Holy Spirit will convict them. Now move to another direction. Move to another direction. And you can see that that movement caused that more people heard about the good news. This was God's plan all along. Now, when we uh, look at uh, servanthood, this is something that you can uh, 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 definitely uh, probably apply to your life. The willingness. Because you love God and you have the heart and the burden for other people. You have the heartbeat of Jesus to seek and save the lost. Very important that you allow yourself to be used. It is not guaranteed that it will always be comfortable. The situation is not always ideal. But the whole point is, what is the thrust of God's mission for you? You're supposed to plant the seed. You're supposed to go to the lost. We are supposed to do this. Now, if you open up your life to other people, that's not going to be easy. If you open up by yourself into serving others, that's not going to be easy. If you follow the prompting and the calling of God, it's not always going to be easy. But if you do this, you're not only fulfilling the great commission as commanded by God. Looking back, you will see yourself quite fruitful. Sometimes the reason why we feel that we are inefficient as believers, we see that there's no dynamism in our Christian life. Probably the problem is a matter of participation. We cannot only be absorbers of truth. We need to know these things and we need to apply them. Because that's part of what God's design is all about in, in Christian living. You will learn this and then you will pass it on. You will enjoy this and you will also share it with others. You know Christ and you enjoy that uh, interaction with him as Lord and Savior. You make him known to others. This is necessary. And if you're not complying with that, definitely, you don't feel the totality of the enjoyment of the Christian life because this is an integral part of it. See? I enjoy reading the Bible, Pastor. Well and good. I enjoy fellowship with believers, pastors, well and good. But you know, there's something else. You have to go to those who have not yet known Christ and tell them about Jesus. That's also something that you should commit yourself to doing. Servanthood. Now, there's a third. We'll be talking about submission. You know, it's not easy to submit. That's the reason why it requires humility. When we talk about our character, our nature, we struggle with three things. I don't know if you will agree with this, but again, I just read it from a behaviorist's point of view. The first one, we struggle with immaturity. What is immaturity? Our inability to delay or to deny gratification. Di ba? Malapit na Christmas, no? Sa Facebook nga, pinipigilan na si Jose Marie Chan, lumabas eh. Huwag daw muna. Sa bear months na. But you know, Filipinos, no? Long Christmas celebration. But my point being, if you go to, for example, the mall, toy store, you have a child with you. Ama, I like that toy. I don't know. Your dad and your mom will be mad at me if I buy you that toy. Ayan. And so the child feels na na-reject siya. What happens? Suddenly cries. Sometimes throws tantrums. And what do you do? Oh, don't cry anymore. How many? How many na? Then you try to pacify the child's anger. Now, the point is, bata eh. 
that's how children are. But you know what? The truth, it's not only children that manifest tantrums. Di ba? Even adults. And that's a proof that we are also immature. But we need to overcome this. The second is called insecurity. And what is insecurity? Somehow, it's hard for us to submit to the authority of others if they're given a chance to lead or they become higher, in a sense, no? in life compared to us. You know, I was reading this material. It talked about crab mentality. The author, uh, he was expanding on the concept, and I agreed with him. You know what he said? For some reason, if a person is beneath you or equal with you, you feel comfortable. Correct? When the person starts to rise from the ranks and becomes probably better than you, sometimes there's a steering up. That person has not done anything wrong to you, but you don't feel comfortable anymore. Why? He is no longer in his proper place. So what's the right thing to do? If we're not going to apply the Christian values, the right thing to do is to pull that person down and bring him back to where he came from, and now I'm comfortable again. <laughs> and that's why crab mentality, the talangka mentality exists. Pulling people down. You don't want them to be, to be you know, on a higher level. But you know, John Maxwell, I was reading his uh, book, The Law of Empowerment, and he was saying, it is quite necessary, and we see it in many models of leadership coming from the Bible, diba? Yung mga narratives about Moses and Joshua and the others. Sometimes we need to give up so others can step up. It's not easy, but that's part of the deal. God has used you, and he's going to use somebody else. You will be in a different field, but are you willing to give up that position? so that somebody else will be taking uh, hold of it as God intended, and the work will continue with its effectivity and quality. It's not easy. It's good to hear, but it's not easy to do, right? It affects us. But again, we have to deal with our insecurities. The third is impulsivity. There are stirring up in our inner person, usually because of negative emotions. Anger. At first, it's irritation. Suddenly, you discover yourself. You're, you're shouting. You're, you're, you're uh, already uh, uh, committed to negative behavior. Why? It's because probably these negative things are already affecting you and your impulsivity comes into the picture. But you know why the Lord is telling us we need to learn the principle of submission? First, it's in connection to Him. Sometimes it's hard for us to submit to God's will. We want our own way. Second, it's hard for us to follow the pattern or the structure, especially when the Lord will be using people whom we think are not equal or lower than us, and then giving them a higher status, or probably they're the ones who are going to teach us. Let me tell you about Samson. Samson was a person who was strong, right? He wouldn't want to listen to lesser beings. His parents were talking sense to him. They didn't want to listen to them. His countrymen were telling him things. He does not want to listen to them. Why? Because he's thinking, I'm stronger. I'm more powerful. And your people are not. But the problem is, these people were being used by God to give him a special blessing. And what is that blessing? It's called warning. <laughs> they were being used by God to be the voice of reason for him. He didn't want to listen. He was so stubborn. He went his own way. And what happened? He fell off a cliff. Not literally. But he perished because of what? His disobedience. His constant interaction with the Philistine women ending with Delilah. So it's very important for us to submit. Now, Going back to Acts 17, what else do you find in the chapter? You find that Apostle Paul, after uh, from being in Thessalonica, pushed to Berea, now he was pushed away again. He had to go to Athens. Now in Athens, he was looking at that particular locality and he saw a lot of idols. And these idols were for the different gods and goddesses of the Greeks. Probably because this is also the time of the Roman Empire. It's also the Greek or Roman gods and goddesses. They were intertwined. Probably you will have the god Zeus, 
Hermes, Aphrodite, and the others. But then, it was quite intriguing that he found there the idol for the unknown God. So, when he was teaching them, many of them were having difficult time understanding what he was saying. So, they needed to put him in a formal forum so that he can talk to them. And those who were listening were coming from Gentile backgrounds, the Epicureans and the Stoics. Now, who are the Epicureans? Well, they also pursue pleasure, but they're saying that it's of the higher kind, the pleasures of the mind, they say. And not only that, these particular people don't want to have extreme experiences of the negative side of life. They want pleasure. They don't want the not pleasurable things. So you know what were the things that they also denied themselves? They denied themselves the anxiety of being concerned about what the gods want. Kasi marami daw yung gusto, they cannot follow, and that causes them anxiety. So much rather dismiss, neglect, or don't believe in the gods anymore. And then the Stoics. The Stoics are looking for eudaimonia. And what is that? The happy life, the pleasurable life. And that's supposed to be a life that's constituted with a balance. At least for them, they call it temperance. Lesser negative experience and maximize positive experiences. But these people are pantheistic. God is everywhere and dwells everything, even inanimate objects. So really, when he was talking to them, all of them were scratching their heads. What are you saying? You're like a babbler. We don't know what you're, what you're talking about. No? He, then he was given an audience in the Areopagus, and now he spoke. Look at how Apostle Paul delivered that particular message. He said, there is a true God. Ang sabi nga niya, the, the audacity of the guy. He said, I know you don't understand what you're, uh, you're thinking. I imagine these are people from Athens. They have a history of good philosophers teaching them. And they are preoccupied with talking about ideas, the new ideas, every day almost. Then you're telling them they don't really understand. True. They're in pursuit of God, but they have an idol for the unknown. They do not know God at all. They're assuming this is God, this is God, this is God. But that you have an idol for an unknown God, most likely you don't really know who God is. So Apostle Paul used that as a springboard. Let me show you who he really is. And then introduced to them the God of the Bible. He talked about the Creator. The Creator that is not uh, affected or in need of any human... Uh, dwelling place being given for him, or uh, uh, he is not completed by what we do for him. Why? He was actually trying to tell them the difference between the Greek gods and goddesses and the true God. The Greek gods and goddesses like Zeus. You have to offer things to him so that he will be strengthened. And the other gods, if not, they, it, it weakens them if you don't worship them. Second, Zeus feels complete if he has romantic relations with with what? Human beings and the other things that were created. That's how they were. But here is a God who is independent of all that. The Creator has no kind of a situation like that, a true God. And then he talked about how we came from him. Then he talked about how we should please him. He ended up talking about God being judge. And so now they realized that we have accountability to the true God. This person understands what he's saying, and this person seems to know what this God really wants. But then, of course, when he talked about the resurrection, uh, some of those uh, people who were listening said they were jeering at him. They didn't like to hear anymore. But some of them, as they were listening to Paul, uh, they understood, and they still wanted to know more, and they followed him. Now, imagine, at this particular point, I'm thinking about how they reacted to him when he was teaching. It's not easy to stand in front of the public, a hostile group. And many of them would practically be shouting at him as he was talking. Now it's not easy to take. But because this is what is necessary to bring across the good news, he was willing to stand in front of them and speak the truth. Right? I mean, we all would like to have a fairy tale uh, sharing of the gospel. Di ba? Tatabi ka dun sa isang tao. Do you know who Jesus is? I want to know. And then at the end of the conversation, the person is crying and saying, I want to accept Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Then we're happy. 
That's a good scenario. It can happen, but that's not always the case. Right? What if it's going to be, there's going to be resistance? Will you hesitate? What if it's difficult? Will you stop? But this particular model says we have to accept that we submit to the pattern of Christ, and this is what is needed, no? And then the last is suffering. <laughs> uh, last month, I spoke at a wedding. It's a mixed wedding of uh, an American and a Filipina. So I wanted to know if the guy has a sense of humor. So I said, in your married life, in the course of it, from beginning to uh, basically the ending, uh, you will be giving your wife three rings, and you will be receiving rings as well. Three rings, I Sabi ko, yes, before you get married, you'll give her a ring. Yes, the engagement ring. Hansi, okay. Uh, what's the second? Sabi ko, when you exchange vows, you'll be giving each other rings. Uh, yes, the wedding ring. What's the third? Uh, after being married for a long time, you'll give each other suffering. No, no, mga Filipino, tawa na tayo dyan. Wala, stoic. <laughs> Sabi ko, uh, uh, hindi siya natawa. <laughs> so... Change of topic. <laughs> I'm a Filipino. I just want to test. But uh, I'm saying this not because uh, we have a penchant for pain. It's not that you're going to chase after suffering and uh, that's going to be the proof that you're truly spiritual. No, 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 no. Suffering, even though you chase after it or not, because you're going to stand up for the Lord, you have conviction in standing for the truth, and you will be maintaining that boundary. Some people will try to pressure you. It's either they would like to pull you out of that, right? Or to push themselves in and make you uncomfortable for having that kind of a boundary in your life. Now remember, the boundary for believers, Romans 12, 2. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know God's will, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know, it's, not, it's easy to recite. Right? It's one verse. But how do you live that out? It requires total commitment and conviction to God. And there are a lot of people who will test you, knowingly or unknowingly. But again, it's a decision you have to make. Am I going to stand for the Lord and keep my testimony so that I will be an effective uh, instrument of God in bringing the good news to others? It's a requirement. It's necessary. So I do hope, brothers and sisters in Christ, as you go look at uh, Acts chapter 17, you don't only see the history of it. That has been the trend of my preaching in the past few months. This time, let's look at uh, the requirements that if we're going to really engage the world and bring forth the good news by committing ourselves to the commission, the great commission of Christ, we will also integrate in our lives what is necessary. And one of those important com uh, components that we need to have is what? Humility. The desire to submit to the will of God and the desire to be used by God so that our lives will be an instrument for other people. Let's all rise and let's close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, as much as we appreciate that we have heard the good news, that through the prompting of your spirit, we have salvation as we have accepted you as personal Lord and Savior. We enjoy salvation, the hope that it brings in our lives. But Lord, more than our personal pleasure in being believers of Jesus Christ, you also gave us a responsibility to pass on the good news so that others may also hear. Lord, you know our life contexts. You know that there are opportunities available for us to share you to people. It may require discomfort coming from us. Sometimes, Lord, it is necessary that we reveal our faith, which sometimes we want to be kept private. And sometimes, Lord, it will mean that we will move forward in a situation that before it was uncomfortable for us, talking with people and sometimes even strangers so that we can tell them about your saving grace. Lord, prompt us, convict us to really have the passion like Paul, 
Silas, and Timothy, that in Acts 17, what was necessary has been done. And we see the efficiency of your word, of your name. But they, we see also the uh, fruit that was born out of their partnership with your great commission. May we experience this as well, Lord, a fruitful Christian life, not only in terms of service in other areas of ministry, but also in sharing the good news. Help us, Lord, to truly be salt and light of the earth for your greater glory. May the love of the Father be upon you all, the saving grace of the Son, and the eternal fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. You may take your seats and we can spend some time in quiet reflection.